Hi, uh, I'm Sadashiva Pai from uh, Science Mission. Uh, welcome to Science Hangout. Today we have uh, Dr. Martin Jibala, is a professor and a chair of the Department of Kinesiology at McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada. So he studies the beneficial effects of exercise at the molecular to whole body level in both healthy individuals as well as people with chronic diseases. Uh, Dr. Jibala's research on the physiological adaptations to interval training has attracted immense scientific attention worldwide and got lots of media coverage. He is the author of the best selling book on the topic, The One Minute Workout. Welcome, Dr. Jibala, to Science Hangout. Thank you for having me on. So let's talk about yourself before we go into all these exercises. And let's talk about yourself. Tell me about yourself, your background, education, how far you have come, how is the journey been? Yeah, sure. So I've been a professor at McMaster for uh, about 20 years. Um, I My undergraduate training was in a field called human kinetics, which goes uh -huh. by different names, including kinesiology, which is the, the study of human movement. Uh, mm -hmm. As an undergraduate, I was uh, interested in physiology. That was the the course that uh, in second year that really inspired my attention, and it taught about uh, how the body worked. Mm -hmm. uh, like a lot of people who come into kinesiology, I was interested in uh, exercise and different sports, and so physiology applied to the body allowed me to think about my training in a different way and and what physiological systems were being. Uh, stimulated. And, and so that was my initial introduction to the field. Uh, and then uh, I completed a, a master's degree in kinesiology. My PhD was in um, uh, human physiology uh, and nutrition. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I did a postdoctoral fellowship uh, overseas at the Copenhagen uh, Muscle Research Center. Uh, my interest in interval training has really stemmed from two things, uh, uh, both a professional and a personal interest. Uh, the professional interest is for a long time, I've taught a course on uh, the integrative physiology of human performance, and the students are always interested in the training regimes of elite athletes. And I would often ask them, well, why do these elite endurance athletes, triathletes and cyclists, uh, why do they train using these short, hard bursts of exercise? Uh, you know, some people call that anaerobic uh, training. And why is that so effective for their endurance performance? Uh, and then personally, I was doing a lot of reading around interval training, starting out, uh, you know, I, like a lot of people, uh, I was uh, very busy, we had young children at the time. And so quite ironically, for a professor of exercise physiology, I found myself with little time to work out. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, maybe I'll try this interval training. And so uh, I, I found that it was something that allowed me to, to maintain my fitness despite a reduced time commitment. And so that was the, the, the personal interest. Okay, and let's talk about your lab, lab people. So just uh, let us know about like how it is, like what is the lab size? Sure. All those yeah, so we, we have a mix of uh, of individuals, uh, always a, a few undergraduate students that get involved. Typically in, in third year, we have a research practicum course. That's a, a one semester course that allows students to get some exposure to the lab. Uh, a couple of undergraduate thesis uh, students uh, and then grad students, typically at any given time, I will have four or five, usually roughly split between um, master's students and, uh, and, and PhDs. Um, I don't have any uh, uh, postdoctoral fellows uh, right now, but I've had a, a postdoctoral fellow in the past. So typically the lab size is uh, eight to 10 students, and that's a mix of uh, junior undergraduates right up to, uh, to senior PhD students. Um, and then here at McMaster, we have a uh, an integrative physiology group uh, that has uh, five or six members, depending how you count. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's quite a stimulating environment with a number of colleagues who study in, in similar uh, but different uh, areas. And so collectively within our exercise metabolism research group, there's 75 or, or 80 people. So it, it makes for a very, I think, stimulating environment for trainees. Okay. And uh, I know you are a busy person with the books, with the research and all those things. How do you spend your uh, other time? Like you have some spare time. How do you spend it? 
Yeah, sure. So I, uh, I, I have two, uh, two children who are both active in, in, in sports. And so part of my time is, uh, uh, spelled, spent volunteering, uh, uh, with them, uh, ice hockey is their, their main sport as well as, uh, one plays baseball. So I like to be involved with uh, their activities in a, a coaching or assisting uh, manner. Obviously, as someone who likes physical activity, I, I, uh, I try to prioritize my exercise uh, time and, uh, and, and fit that in, into my day. Uh, and then, uh, you know, some reading, some other pursuits, thing, things like that. But uh, uh, that's what uh, consumes most of my time is either my work or, or my family. Okay. And coming back to science part of it, you wrote a book recently on uh, one minute uh, workout. So like, let's get into a little bit more detail about what is this one minute workout? Who invented it? How long it has been there? Tell tell us about a little bit more in detail because people may not know about it, some of the people. So. Sure. So, you know, my lab broadly speaking, focuses on or has been interested in studying the physiology of interval exercise training. And so I'm sure many people have heard of interval training, which is really just alternating periods of more intense effort with recovery within a single training session. Uh, athletes have used the technique effectively for well over 100 years. And even at the turn of the century, uh, some high profile athletes who were winning Olympic gold medals and world championships in endurance type sports uh, or activities uh, were nonetheless using interval training as a way uh, to uh, to help their uh, performance. And then over the course of time, uh, interval training is it it's rediscovered, if you will, every few years or every decade or so. Uh, and so we get a lot of credit for studying interval training, but it's really just versions on a theme of what people have previously been interested in. Over the last ten or fifteen years, though, I think there's been two main areas. One has been the application of interval training to less trained individuals, non-healthy individuals. We've done studies, for example, applying interval training to people with type 2 diabetes. My colleagues have studied it in a cardiovascular or cardiac rehab setting. So in people who've had a, a heart attack or a myocardial infarction, looking at uh, recovery and the application of interval training in those individuals. So Definitely, there's been an explosion of research interest in the application of interval exercise training to these people who are, are not young, fit athletes. And secondly, and where the title of the book comes from, we've been interested in the question of how low can you go or looking at really small doses of interval exercise and showing that you can have adaptations, including in health markers, which we normally associate with much more traditional endurance exercise. And so some of our protocols has involved exercise as little as three 20 second bursts wow. of vigorous exercise that adds up to a minute. Uh, and so that was really the uh, background for the title of the book, uh, the one minute uh, workout. Okay. So do you think this one minute workout is good enough for somebody to keep fit? Like what is your experiment says? Yeah, so so uh, let me uh, answer that a couple of ways. So the, the short answer is yes, you can achieve improvements in many different uh, markers that are important for health with these short, vigorous exercise bouts. And in some of our studies, we've shown that, for example, doing these three 20-second bursts of activity, you can have improvements in health markers that are very similar to what you would achieve with more traditional moderate intensity continuous exercise. And so in one study, we looked at 12 weeks of interval exercise training, uh, where the total time commitment was only 10 minutes, three times a week. And so within those 10 minute periods, that was one minute of very vigorous exercise with a warm up, cool down. And so one group doing 10 minute time commitment with only one minute of vigorous exercise, another group doing 50, five zero minutes of continuous exercise three times a week. So big differences in time commitment. And what we found was the improvement in their cardiorespiratory fitness, the improvement in measures of blood sugar control, insulin sensitivity were very similar despite these big differences in time commitment. And we think that resonates with people or has some application because the number one cited barrier for why people are not more active is time or a lack of it. Mm -hmm. um, are we suggesting that that's all that people should do? No, absolutely not. The, the public health guidelines are based on very good science. Um, but when you are time pressed, interval exercise can be a very effective 
uh, option. Uh, and so part of our approach is uh, what we and others have called the movement menu. So there's there's some more there's some traditional uh, choices or selections, and we'd like to expand that menu that people can can select from. And on those days when you're particularly time pressed or periods of your life when you're very busy, uh, interval exercise can be very effective. And it might it be 20 seconds of vigorous stair climbing a few times through the day, or this notion of exercise snacking can nonetheless be very effective. Okay, so like, as you said, like within uh, in three months, uh, I, I think you said like 12 weeks, right? 12 yeah. weeks, that is about three months, you can basically get the same kind of uh, uh, physical fitness as you get with normally like 150 minutes of exercise. Yeah, exactly. And you know, that's been our longest study to date, but definitely you can see these changes very quickly as well. And for example, in our studies on type two diabetics, uh, as little as six of these interval training sessions over two weeks uh, was enough for us to see improvements in their blood sugar control. Uh, and even mechanistically, when we looked at uh, uh, biopsies from their skeletal muscles, we could show an improvement in glucose transport capacity. So that's obviously these uh, proteins that are responsible for bringing glucose into the cell and obviously then lowering it in your blood. Uh, we could see these changes very, very quickly. So you can have changes uh, quite rapidly. Uh, and if you continue to do this, uh, these changes are maintained over time. So you mentioned that there is a, in a diabetics, you have done these studies. So like, and also heart patient, are these done studies done in controlled environment or like anybody, like do they need some doctor's advice if somebody wants to do it? Yeah. These are done uh, obviously in, uh, in, in controlled environments. And so for example, in our studies on type two diabetics, uh, every uh, participant before they were enrolled into the study, uh, they went through a, a 12 lead uh, ECG exercise stress test and we received physician clearance for them to be enrolled in the study. And some of them were not cleared to participate in this type of activity. Uh, and obviously in the cardiac rehab setting, it's, it's, it's quite similar. So our, our advice to individuals is uh, twofold. One, at the individual level, if you're considering interval exercise training, it makes sense uh, to, be, uh, to check with your physician and be properly uh, screened because on an individual level, uh, someone may have silent risk factors uh, that may not make them suitable for this type of exercise. But on a big picture level, people do not need to be afraid of interval exercise training. And uh, really, you're just talking about scaling the intensity properly for a given individual. But as I mentioned, interval training has been widely studied now and shown to be effective in individuals with metabolic syndrome, heart disease, uh, coronary artery disease, diabetes, um, older individuals. Uh, so again, at the big picture level, uh, it's been widely applied and studied and shown to be effective. But at the individual level, we definitely recommend uh, proper screening uh, mm -hmm. before you'd start or change your exercise uh, program. And the last point I would make is interval training can range from these all out, very vigorous activities like the one minute workout to something as simple as interval walking. So just picking up the or varying the pace of what's otherwise low intensity walking activity, even something as simple as interval walking has been shown to be more effective at improving fitness and blood sugar control than just continuous steady state walking in obese older individuals with type 2 diabetes. And that's that's good that you mentioned about it because like I was thinking about, hey, okay, like if, intense exercise some younger kids can do like a 20s 30s 40s but if you think about 50s 60s people or 70s they want something like more than what they are doing like regular walking they can also do the brisk walking for about 20 seconds stop it do it slow motion for another minute or so again 20 seconds brisk walking so that will help them too exactly and that's been shown to be effective so the analogy is if your only exercise is walking around the block at night after dinner uh, pick up the pace for a few light posts mm -hmm. and then back off. And as simple as that sounds, uh, that's been shown to be actually uh, more effective than just the continuous steady state walking. So our advice is just get out of your comfort zone a little bit uh, for a period of time and then uh, back off. Uh, 
another question regarding this uh, walking like uh, high intensity workout so is there any guidelines like you need to do something initially like uh, preparation for this kind of exercise or like you can just go and do it so uh, you know and and so if someone is just completely sedentary and they they don't do any exercise at all the general advice would be to to start slow and build from there and so for those individuals even doing just some steady state walking to start uh, would be recommended. Uh, and we also know that for lowering your risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes and dying from all causes, just moving out of that lowest level of fitness provides the most benefit. So doing anything is going to be better than nothing and probably provides the most uh, benefit uh, for, for you. Uh, and, and from there, you can start to you know, scale it appropriately. Um, also, the type of exercise uh, plays a role here. And so it's not only about potential cardiovascular risk, especially if someone who's older, maybe uh, a little bit heavier, they have joint concerns. And so there's certain types of activities that are more suited to interval exercise. So cycling, swimming, rowing, these are non or less weight bearing activities. And so the relative stress on the joints is, is quite low and similar to continuous forms of exercise. Now, if you're doing stair climbing or running or running uphill, the potential for the impact forces on the joints and the potential for injury uh, is going to be higher. Uh, and so, uh, again, this is where we really have to say what type of interval training are we talking about? And it it's a, it's a broad uh, spectrum. So there's certain types that are appropriate for certain individuals and certain types that are probably not appropriate. So consult your doctor before you start doing any, something like this. Yes. And this is where, you know, if, if people are able to even, uh, you know, a session or two with a good qualified or certified personal trainer, if, uh, if that's available to them, it can be, it can be worth the time and the investment. Um, but otherwise, there's there's a lot of resources online. Uh, and, you know, the reason I wrote my book was to try and distill what's often complex and conflicting science down into hopefully what's an accessible read for individuals and to provide some guidance. Uh, and in the in the book, for example, we provide 12 different interval training workouts, all based on scientific studies. But they range from what we call the beginner, with which is really just interval walking all the way up to the one minute workout, which would be one of the most vigorous and intense uh, versions. Okay. And uh, like each organ has its own internal clock, they say. And uh, like you mentioned about all the hormone secretion, insulin and all those things. Is there any good time to do this uh, hit or like you can do it anytime? I, the big answer is you can do it anytime. Uh, and so I think the message for people is, do what works for you, do what fits into your schedule. We've done some studies, for example, looking at um, whether people did interval training uh, twice a day or once every other day, or if they did interval training in the morning after an overnight fast, or if they did it later in the day after eating or in the morning with breakfast or not breakfast. And the big picture answer is all of those can be effective there may be some slight subtle differences, but you know, if you exercise in the morning after an overnight fast, maybe you burn a few more calories from fat, but in the big picture, it doesn't really matter, especially if you're not a morning person. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty true. Like, like my, I go for uh, exercise, like basically before uh, lunch or after before uh, dinner, but my wife wants to eat something before she goes for exercise. So I think it is individual thing. So whatever works for you, you should do, I guess. That's the message, I guess, you are saying. It is really the big picture message. You know, if you're the elite athlete who really cares about the nth degree of performance, then we can really dial it in for you. But for 99% of the population, it probably doesn't matter. And so uh -huh. uh, it's more important to just get it in and be consistent rather than exactly when you do it. So now going back, uh, going to the biochemical part of it, like, Okay. We have mentioned all these, you have mentioned various types of exercise you can do and all those things. So some of your work shows that this generates like more mitochondria. Can you please explain how does it help? 
Yeah, so first of all, you know, mitochondria are obviously extremely important. Uh, we mainly study mitochondria in skeletal muscle, uh, which obviously is uh, very active during exercise. And uh, we also know that individuals who have a higher mitochondrial content in their muscles, uh, that's associated with a lower risk of developing various chronic diseases, including things like type 2 diabetes. Um, now, whether those are directly causally related or just associated, there's some debate, but the bottom line is more mitochondria is good, uh, whether you're an athlete or just an average person who's looking to uh, maintain your health. Uh, we know that uh, these uh, mitochondria, which are, are, are like networks that run through the fiber, uh, you can expand or increase the density of these mitochondria in muscle and the the molecular signaling pathways that cause this are, are fairly well understood now and fairly well articulated. And in some of our studies, we've looked at and demonstrated that these short bursts of interval exercise can activate mitochondrial biogenesis or this process of creating new or additional mitochondria, uh, very similar to traditional exercise. So we've literally shown at the molecular level that the process of creating more mitochondria can be triggered in in different ways uh, and so the analogy we use is uh, it's a bit like you know uh, a gas pedal and so as you the traditional way is you step on the gas pedal and that's going to lower the the fuel gauges slowly in your muscles and your body responds to that drop in fuel over time what it appears is you can step on the gas pedal very hard drop the fuel gauges relatively quickly even if it's for a short period of time, and the, the molecular energy sensors in the body appear to respond uh, in, in a similar manner. And, and so that's sort of a simple analogy uh, that people might understand for, for why uh, we think these short bouts of exercise can nonetheless be, be effective. It comes down to these molecular fuel gauges in muscle and what they sense. Okay. And there is another molecule which is known to involved in the energy metabolism, which is called creatine kinase. Like athletes use creatine to boost their energy and all those things. So is there any work done on uh, looking at the creatine kinase enzyme? Uh, there is. And you know, from, from sprint training, uh, there you can definitely develop your uh, non-aerobic or anaerobic uh, pathways. And, and so, so there's some evidence that your ability to, to utilize uh, phosphocreatine and work through the creatine kinase uh, pathway uh, faster, that can be upregulated, but there's not much evidence to suggest that creatine supplementation is, uh, is beneficial for aerobic uh, uh, performance. We know that creatine supplementation is effective uh, for doing these shorter repeated bouts of exercise. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily translate into more mitochondria, uh, for, uh, for example. Okay. And uh, exercise is known to affect the brain functions, which is well known. So how about your uh, intense training helps with the brain function? Yeah, that's a, a newer area of investigation. And so certainly we're collaborating with some uh, people who are brain experts here at McMaster, mm -hmm. both on the, uh, the neurogenesis side of things. So literally... Uh, can, uh, you know, can the, can the structure and function of the brain change, uh, and also on the behavioral side. So does this, uh, potentially, uh, promote learning, for example. And so some of my colleagues are interested in these, uh, questions, manipulating the intensity, the, basically the dose of exercise and what does that mean? Uh, and can, if you make people more fit, uh, does that mean, uh, indices of brain function are, are, are enhanced. So that's definitely a very active area of research. Uh, but some of my colleagues, for example, have shown that taking short activity bouts can actually enhance outcomes on standardized uh, testing of, of, of students. So uh, literally taking a break during your class and doing a little bit of movement uh, may actually enhance learning. There's some evidence for that. Okay, that is interesting to know. And uh, getting back to like exercise means like you need skeletal muscle, all those things like uh, it helps you build up muscle a little bit. So like I have seen some of your work on this uh, muscle fiber recruitment. Can you please elaborate on that? 
Yeah, so you know, broadly speaking, there's two main types of muscle fibers, uh, type one or slow twitch fibers. These are fibers that we utilize or recruit all the time for relatively low intensity effort activities of daily living. And these type two, these larger, more uh, powerful fast twitch muscle fibers, and those are the types of fibers in particular that have been implicated or associated with aging that uh, they can sort of atrophy more over, over time. Definitely with interval exercise training, part of the benefit is you recruit all of these muscle fibers and there's some suggestions that that's what makes interval exercise training particularly beneficial is rather than just having a population of fibers that respond, you recruit and, and all of these fibers adapt uh, to the exercise. And so again, right now we have some ongoing studies through some collaborations looking at fiber specific uh, adaptations in uh, in mitochondria uh, with this uh, with this type of, uh, of of training. Okay, and people also talk about stem cells. Like when you do these exercises, it helps you to get like especially in the brain and all. So, is there any work done on heat and uh, any stem cell work? I, I think there's some emerging research. You know, look because one of the big questions in in physiology is how you know. Okay, I exercise. My muscles work, uh, my heart works hard, uh, my blood vessels uh, stretch and flex to allow the blood and oxygen to move through. So you can appreciate, okay, it makes sense that those particular organs or tissues or cells would respond and adapt. But how does exercise make our skin more supple? Or you know, how does exercise enhance brain health? And so clearly this suggests some sort of inter-organ communication. Um, and there's been interest in uh, myokines, which are proteins released from muscle fibers that may circulate to other tissues. Uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Mark Tarnopolsky, has used the term exerkine to describe these proteins or compounds that might be released specifically in response to exercise. Uh, and Mark has a big interest in these potential exerkines and how they might uh, facilitate some of these adaptations in other uh, other organs and, and, and cells. And so again, another area of, of very active research, uh, how does exercise signal to these uh, other uh, areas of the body and, and cause adaptation there? And one of the known functions like with this kind of activities like high, high intensity workout is like VO2 at max. So like just explain on that, like how it is helpful for the sure. human health. So, so VO2 max is, what that means is the maximum rate of oxygen use by the body. And so typically you measure VO, VO2 max, much like an exercise stress test. You have people do progressively higher workloads on a bike and measure their oxygen uptake, usually through, through a mask. Um, VO2 max is really important if you're an endurance athlete, you need a very high VO2 max to be able to compete successfully. But it's also very important for everyday individuals as well, because it's the best objective marker of cardiorespiratory fitness. And so people will hear this term, cardio health or cardiorespiratory fitness. And what that means is it's really just VO2 max. Uh, and we know that individuals who have a higher cardiorespiratory fitness have a lower risk of developing chronic diseases and have a lower risk of dying. And so, for example, People who have roughly a 10% higher cardiorespiratory fitness on average, their risk of dying is about 13% lower. Their risk of developing chronic diseases is about 15% lower. And that's a very strong and well-established relationship to the point where uh, a couple of years ago, there was a call from the American Heart Association that cardiorespiratory fitness should be a vital sign that we measure, just like body temperature and blood pressure. Um, the challenge, of course, is it's not something that's easily measured in the doctor's office, but there are some pretty good online calculators. And so if your listeners might want to get a pretty good index of their cardiorespiratory fitness, I would encourage them to Google world fitness level. And there's a calculator that they can uh, plug in some numbers, their age, their sex, typical activity levels, their resting heart rate, and it'll give them a, a decent estimate of their cardiorespiratory fitness. And that calculator is based on uh, a trove of good data that's been collected 
uh, in, in Norway. So it's not a perfect calculator, but it's a pretty good index and it can at least allow them to track changes in their fitness over time. So are they improving or decreasing uh, over time? But cardiorespiratory fitness, VO2 max, it's important whether you're an athlete or just an average individual. And you also mentioned that in insulin sensitivity, the metabolism is better with these kind of exercises. Can you please elaborate on that? Yeah. So generally speaking, exercise uh, training of any way is a, is a, or any type is a, a way, a mechanism to improve your insulin sensitivity, probably related in part to this enhanced ability to transport glucose uh, or blood sugar by skeletal muscle. Definitely, uh, there's evidence to show that interval training can be a time effective way or time efficient way to improve uh, your, your insulin sensitivity. You know, this is largely based on what I would call proof of concept studies. So some relatively small studies that, uh, that show these benefits. And so sometimes when I talk about interval training, I'll use the analogy of it's a bit like the new drug on the market. So it's, it's showing a lot of efficacy in smaller phase trials, uh, early investigations, but we don't have the robust evidence from, uh, you know, level four or grade A evidence from large scale randomized controlled studies uh, looking at interval exercise training versus the traditional approach. And so certainly the field is moving in this manner. Uh, and that's why, for example, we don't see interval training generally reflected in the public health guidelines. You know, the American guidelines were recently updated and there was not a specific recommendation to say you should do this much interval training and that's going to be as good as the traditional approach. But certainly one thing the American guidelines did, they removed what had been a previous suggestion that exercise has or physical activity had to be accumulated in bouts of 10 minutes at a time. Uh, now the guidelines suggest exercise of any duration can be effective. And I think that's in part owing to some of the interval training studies that have shown these benefits with very, very small doses and certainly not uh, anywhere close to 10 minutes of continuous activity at a time. So I think that was a positive change in the recent U.S. guidelines. So like, as you said, like uh, it may not replace right now the traditional whatever people are doing. So you do the regular thing plus add this one minute thing in between so that will help you. And for those who don't have time, so always the complaint, oh, I don't have time. Hey, you can spare one minute of time or 10 minutes. So you can do that one minute exercise. That is where you think it is for the people is more beneficial. Yeah, I do. And uh, again, I come back to this idea, time is the number one sided barrier. Clearly it's an excuse for a lot of people, uh, but mm -hmm. some people lead very busy time press lives. The other point I would make about interval exercise is it's a type of activity you can incorporate anywhere, you know? And so we hear stair climbing is good for us. But in our recent studies, we were looking at people who are doing these stair climbing exercise snacks. And so what that involved was just 20 seconds of vigorous stair climbing. That's about 60 stairs or about fl three flights, if you're trying to picture what that is. And people did that three times through the day. So a 20, 20 second bout of vigorous stair climbing just three times through the day with up to four hours of time in between, even that was effective enough for us to see a measurable change in their fitness. Now, the fitness improvement wasn't as good as what we've seen with our other uh, more involved interval training studies. So again, we're not suggesting a few exercise snacks is going to provide all of the benefits, but it at least can be effective. And so on those days when you're particularly time pressed, just taking the stairs at work uh, as you come into your office again at lunch or on a break and before you go home, it can still be a good preventative maintenance dose of exercise. Uh, you know, another analogy is, or another example is what I call hotel room workouts. So on those days when you're traveling, you don't have access to your regular facilities, you can do some sort of body weight intervals in your room. Uh, think of things like burpees, push-ups, uh, running in place, jumping jacks, uh, air squats. These types of exercise that don't require specialized equipment, uh, it doesn't require any large particular space, it just gets your heart rate up. Uh, that can be very effective application of interval training principles to at least maintain and otherwise give your fitness a boost.
So now that you brought it up, it is interesting that like some of us like think that, oh, it is too cold to go out during yeah. winter. So you better sit at home or if you have stairs, go up and down the, on the stairs and get your workout done at least a few times a day. That will help you. Yeah, again, part of it is it's a mind shift a little bit. You know, a lot of people think exercise is this thing that we do at a gym after we change into our spandex. You know, if you like to do that, fantastic. Keep doing it. But it's not the only way. It, it's about physical activity. And, you know, we've done such a good job of engineering physical activity out of our lives that we have to look for ways to incorporate it back in. And what we're reminding people is, you don't need a gym. You don't need specialized equipment. Uh, you don't even need much time uh, in order to uh, to get these uh, bouts of physical activity in. And even very short bouts can nonetheless be effective for your health. So finally, let's talk about your book. So where you can find your book and if at all somebody wants to contact you to learn more about interval exercise or to do some research in your lab. So what is the best way to go about it? Sure. So the book is called The One Minute Workout. Uh, it was published by Penguin Random House. Uh, you can get it uh, online. It's available as an audio book as well. So uh, you can pretty much uh, find it anywhere, but certainly on Amazon and all of the, uh, the major uh, booksellers. Um, uh, my website is uh, martingabala.com. And so people could find information on our research. Uh, they could find other podcasts uh, like this that uh, that I've done on various uh, topics, uh, and they can see some of the uh, media reports uh, on our on our research as well. And they can contact me through that uh, site as well. Uh, I'm not particularly active on social media, but uh, I tweet occasionally uh, at Gabala M, uh, so people can also follow me there uh, or tweet at me, and uh, I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions. So thank you very much, Dr. Gabala. So I really appreciate your help in educating the people about this uh, high interval ex exercise. So look forward to seeing your uh, good work in the near future. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to be on and uh, share some of this with your listeners. Thank you. Thank you.